Come on and clap your hands, everybody. Have your seats, amen. We thank God for your liberality and your giving. How many have an imagination for what God is getting ready to do, amen? That eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, the kind of blessings that are going to follow and overtake me. I don't know about you, but I got a big imagination. Hallelujah. So if you can imagine that God can do exceedingly beyond you could ask or think, somebody ought to just start hollering up in here. Amen. If God can do it, God can do it. God can do it in the name of the Lord. So good to see so many faces and uh, got all kind of folks here in town and uh, certainly wanted to acknowledge another one of my comrades and colleagues in the work that we do all across the country. Um, this is a wonderful sister. She's actually a native of San Francisco right along with uh, me and our family. We didn't meet in San Francisco. We met out in the field in the work and we found out that we was HP, amen, homies, amen. The womb of HP produced a whole lot of good people. And uh, she's in the house today, Isabel Moses. Just wave your hand and stand, everybody. Isabel is here. Clap your hands for her. And her mother is here. Thank God for Sister Moses being here as well. Amen. Y'all ought to thank God for Sister Isabel. Uh, I, I, when I was uh, first getting started in the work of trying to juggle being, uh, you know, more of a national figure and trying to stay faithful to the work that I was called to do here, she was working at a place called the Management Center. And uh, uh, I don't know if she was uh, uh, assigned to me by someone who knew that I was a piece of work or if she was just generously offered to me. Either way, she helped get me very, very uh, organized in as much as McBride can be organized. And uh, it's been a great blessing, so I thank God for her for sure. And uh, it's been a great blessing. Good to see one of our OG homies, Brother Lamont Snare in the house. Hey, man, that's my dog. Hey, man, we... We did a lot of work together. We're going to keep doing a lot of more work. We're great to see him in the house. And all you, the people of God, we certainly love you with the love of the Lord. Let's thank God for our music ministry and, and uh, Lauren and the whole ministry team. Amazing. If you are a singer, if you are anyone with a musical skill, an instrumental, instrument, instrumentation, all of that, y'all should come hang out with them on Thursdays. Uh, and uh, it'll be good at 7 o'clock, 7.30. You tell yourself 7, though, because you know you're not going to be on time. Amen. No, I'm just playing. 7.30 for all you who live on time. The rest of us live in time, and uh, we definitely want you all to be there. If there's an empty seat, would you just mind scooting towards the middle aisle? Scoot towards the middle aisle if there's an empty seat near you, because we do have some folks that are still going to be showing up, and we don't want them to have to, to uh, get all on top of you. Let's turn our attention to the Word of God. Uh, we're going to have somewhat of an abbreviated message today because we de definitely want to make sure we create and make time for our time of Eucharistic fellowship and communion. First John chapter number 3. First John chapter number 3, uh, verse 1 through 3 is where we'll be reading. It's our lectionary passage uh, we're going to be picking up today. Uh, this whole month, we're going to be going through a, a apropos series on seasons, uh, how to make it through seasons. And, and uh, I hope that on the heels of our most recent series on grace, how to be what you can't earn, uh, that this will be a good bridge as we move into Advent, uh, the season where we prepare ourselves for certainly the coming of Jesus. And we definitely want all of us uh, to, to be mindful that uh, Advent is the literal s restarting of the church's calendar. How many of you know, as we're talking about seasons, that uh, there is a time on earth that is set, and then there is God's time? Hello, somebody. And you ought to be glad that the world's time and God's time are on two different schedules. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the world's time and God's time will line up really nice and neatly. And then other times, they will be diametrically opposed to one another. And then you and I, as followers of Jesus, people of God, we have to figure out how do we stay true to God's time. 
in a world that is always trying to put you on its time. Hello, somebody. And so this is a wonderful passage that I uh, am always compelled by because it helps to make explicit what is often implicit, this idea that uh, you and I are always people under construction. And uh, if you don't think you're under construction, amen, then we got a little bit of work to do with you today, amen, uh, because you are not the finished product yet. Amen. Let's see what the Word of God has to say. First John chapter 3, verse number 1. Now, John, First John, the book of John is written by the Apostle John. He was actually one of the youngest disciples to follow Jesus. Many thought he was maybe as young as 16, 17 years old. He was probably the longest living apostle. They think he died around 90 or so, uh, exiled on an island called Patmos. And uh, this was a colony like, a, a, like Alcatraz, you know what I'm saying? And uh, it's very fascinating uh, because if you follow Jesus faithfully during that time, you did not end up in a mansion on a hill. Mm. Following Jesus ended up having you uh, on the outside, on the margins of society and uh they were so compelled by what they experienced with Jesus, though, that it did not cause them to retreat from their faith. But many of them leaned in even the more. And uh, my hope and prayer is in this age of, of uh, uh, false religion and, and uh, human subjugation that we all will lean in and follow Jesus faithfully. Because what the world needs is not more uh, false religion. The world needs some false followers of Jesus to let their light shine brightly in a very troubling age. Amen. Let's take a look at the, what the word of God says. First John chapter number one, uh, verses one through three. What marvelous love the father has extended to us. Just look at it. I think this is the message translation. We're called children of God. Somebody say, I am a child of God. That's who we are really are. But that's also why the world doesn't recognize us or take us seriously because it has no idea who God is or what God is up to. But friends, that's exactly who we are. Children of God. And that's only the beginning. Whew, what a starting point though, right? I'm editorializing now. That's not up there, I don't think. That's only the beginning. You know, it's a blessing to be able to start from a place of such privilege in a relationship with God. Amen. Now, you're not starting from a place of deficit. Who you are now is a child of God. You ought to clap. Just pat yourself on the chest. I am a child of God. And that matters because, you know, if you're a child of God, that means that, you know, you, you, you're not supposed to be full of the devil. Praise God. Mm -hmm. And uh, that also means that if the devil is on your tracks, that the devil uh, can't do much with the children of God. That's only the beginning. Who knows how we'll end up? What we know is that when Christ is openly revealed, We'll see him, and in seeing him, become like him. Woo. All of us who look forward to God's coming, stay ready. That's what we talked about what? We stay winning. Man, if I was thinking, I'd have had my sermon today talking about we stay ready. Maybe that'd be the subtext, Amen. All of us who look forward to God's coming, stay ready with the glistening purity of Jesus' life as a model for our own. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. All right, we're going to spend a few moments uh, talking about um, waiting for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our heart. So we will not sin against you and please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen 
Somebody say, wait for it. All right. Let's invoke the subtopic. Somebody say, stay ready. Stay ready. I was almost going to play this song by the birds called uh, To Everything Turn, Turn, Turn. There is a... Y'all didn't, didn't think I knew that song, huh? But the only reason I know that song because it was a commercial. And I, I didn't know that, I, I, you know, you grow up and you just see all these commercials. You didn't know that it was a song. I just thought it was a jingle. But the, 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 the song came on my mind as I was putting my sermon together this week. And then I was trying to find a way to play it. Then I realized we have copyright issues because we're streaming. And then they'll literally take our stream down. Can you believe these folk? Ooh. So I just gave you a little piece of it just to stimulate your mind. But the scripture, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, really lays this all out when we're talking about seasons and what you and I must be willing to wrestle with if we are going to be people of faith, people of of, of moral clarity in an age where all of that is definitely problematized, if not blurred. Ecclesiastes, the wisdom writer, says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to cast away, a time to end or rend, and a time to sow, a time to keep silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. All of these times create seasons that are worthy of our struggle. And inasmuch as we are passing from one season to another, it is so important for you and I to appreciate that each season elicits something from all of us. This past week, of course, we, you know, uh, some of us watched, some of us participated, some of us regretted Halloween, amen. Uh, I was speaking uh, at, at, at a general hospital in San Francisco uh, to their, their surgeons and different people about the violence prevention work that we do, and they're trying to figure out how can we as general hospital respond to all the, the gunshot wounds that are coming in, how can we be more faithful? So I'm in there, you know, and I'm rolling, right? And I'm just talking, and then all of a sudden out the corner of my eye, I see a witch. And I'm talking, you know, I'm, you know, many of you see me do my thing, you know, I get to moving and get to flowing. I be sweating like I'm preaching. And all of a sudden I said, oh, Jesus. <laughs> and I hadn't had that much sleep that night and everything. So I just, I, I forgot it was Halloween. So I just, it just, it just, it jarred me. And I thought I was seeing things in the meeting. And then I said, oh, Halloween. And she apologized. And after I gathered myself again, I went back into my peacemaking work. Uh, but it's so fascinating that a season would elicit all kinds of responses from us. Amen. You know, all of us put on costumes. And just because of that one day, you know, it's surprising what is in us. Amen. You know, you get a license to put on a costume, and it's surprising what you've been thinking about all these many months. <laughs> uh, I have it in my household, amen. They asked me, Daddy, what are you going to dress up as? I said, a black man. That's, what I'm, that's my costume. It's the only one I know. And my daughter is like, Daddy, we don't understand. I was like, I know. But in reality, how many of you know if you are dressing up in a costume on any day 
that is not Halloween, those very same people who will celebrate you for your costume. Kind of be like, hmm. <laughs> we were in Seattle. <laughs> Sorry, I got so many stories. I'm just a walking storyteller. And, and, and there was someone dressed up, looked like in a costume, and the people I was in was laughing like, they, they, they dressed up on the wrong. Now, it was just a day or two after. And I thought about that. I was like, ain't that fascinating that you can dress up in a costume on the wrong day and people will laugh at you? when the day before they were celebrating. <laughs> Seasons. There are certain moments and times that fit certain responses. But there are also some moments and times where you are required to do something different. And one of the hardest things for us to endure are the changing of seasons. I can remember when we were in Ferguson and, and, you know, we was all turned up and all of us out there just protesting. And I got so in love with the young people in Ferguson that I said, I'm going to start the way in St. Louis. And the young people were like, yeah, pastor, we need, we need some revolutionary preaching and pastors like you and your brother. So we driving around all around town and we're literally looking at abandoned church buildings, buildings that had been, you know, boarded up because we were going to start us a church in St. Louis. And then the winter came. Oh, thank you, Jesus. The season changed. And all that fire I had about a St. Louis ministry got cooled by that Midwest. They call it a hawk, praise God. It's going to hit you with the hawk. And I realized that that was an impulse. It was not a conviction. <laughs> Anybody ever had an impulse versus a conviction? Amen. And that's when I thank God for the shifting of the seasons. Because how many of you know when the seasons shift, they test whether you have impulses or convictions. And many of us don't pay attention to the seasons. And so we'll build our whole life off of an impulse. And because you don't have the necessary conviction, when the season changes... Lord, help me. I'm preaching to myself. You be sitting around here trying to figure out, Lord, why did I make this decision in the summer? Should at least put some time on this thing. Amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him, just put some time on it. Just put some time on it. You know, part of what I want you to appreciate is that seasons will always change. And you and I have to be people who are moved and anchored by the promises of God who uh, never speaks what God does not intend to fulfill. You and I just have to wait for it. Now, waiting for God whew, is quite a hmm, tumultuous task. Because while we're waiting, how many of you know there is often a consistent visitation of death and despair? And yet, waiting for God requires us to be mindful of the persistent truth of resurrection and hope. That while death and despair may be consistent, Resurrection and hope must be persistent. It must be the fuel that causes us to persist through time, which can often be an enemy to our hopes and our dreams. Because while it's true that I believe that every word of the Lord is true and every promise will be fulfilled, I often have times where time can be a powerful threat to my confidence in God. Because I'm ready for God. You know, when God says something, I'm ready for God to do it now. Man, I'm one of these, you know, Genesis type people where God spoke and then it happened. <laughs> That's what I want. God speak, boom! All right, here we go. Here we go. This is what I'm talking about. And then God speak, and then, you know, God be lingering. <laughs> and you be waiting. 
God be lingering. You be waiting. Part of the challenge is we think that our time schedule is God's. But how many of you know? We had old say you sing a song, you can't hurry God. See, we don't sing these songs no more because we don't like them. <laughs> you can't hurry God. You just have to wait. Mm, the devil is a lie. That's what we say. Then it goes on. You have to trust God and give God more time. No matter how long it takes. For he's a God that you can't hurry. He'll be there. So don't you worry. He may not come when you want him, but he's right on time. Woo, them old songs, them old songs, them old songs. Some of y'all need to learn them old songs. Them songs brought the, brought the saints through some trials and tribulations. These songs we singing now don't even get us, get us to the bed at night. We just like, what's, what's this stuff I'm talking about, you know? Waiting for God. You got to learn. We have to learn to wait for God. I don't want to outrun God. Because if I outrun God, then I'm leaving behind all the things that God brings as a benefit to our journey. And in this world and moment where we are under attack from all kind of angles, we got attack from systems. We got attack from crazy people in systems. We got attack from people in denial about systems. We got attack from people who know they are full of hatred. And they're attacking us every which way. We got folk in our families who are manipulating us, trying to get us to be a worse version of ourselves than we intend to be. <laughs> Anybody been around any kind of folk? It's like, I know, God, you created me to be good. Woo! Oh, but why you put this person in my life? Do I have any real folk in here? Amen. You just be wondering, God, where did this person come from? I didn't ask for it. They just showed up. Waiting and enduring the seasons of change for the child of God requires us to be mindful of many things. But I want to read a few scriptures that I think just reinforce why we must be able to wait. Verse uh, Psalms 37 to 34 says, Wait for the Lord and keep God's way, and God will exalt you to inherit the land. You will look on when the wicked are cut off. Mm. Somebody say, wait on the Lord. Now, you know, I, I've been using wicked a lot in my meetings with politicians and other folk because that's the only word that jars them these days. You can say, you wrong, you're like, oh, whatever, that's relative. <laughs> say, I say, you evil, you know, that's, that's not a person. But when I say you wicked, <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, you, be, you just got to be ready for the response. Don't go to tell your boss you wicked and then think you're going to keep your job. <laughs> but, you know, brother like me, I ain't worried about it, praise God. I'm willing to get the... Uh, uh, Lamentations 325, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Micah 7, 7, but as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation, for my God will hear me. Somebody say, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. Child of God, you must wait in the time of seasons that are shifting and moving at a speed or a pace that you cannot fully ascertain. Because if not, you may find yourself living on the wrong schedule. Walking around in a costume when it's not Halloween. <laughs> Hello, somebody. Wearing some falsities that are not fully able to give an account of who God created you to be. I don't know about you, but I'm asking God, help me to wait for your voice. Help me to wait for your healing. Wait for your words. 
And God, when you show up, help me then to move as fast as I want you to respond. Because, you know, God will speak, and you don't like it, and then you dragging your feet. It's like, God, I want you to hurry up. Say it. Do it. God says it and does it. you like, um. <laughs> uh, go get that therapy. Um. Move on. Um. Stop being so toxic, mean, angry, petty, um. <laughs> Stop reaching for power when you're called to serve. Um. Wouldn't it be something if the followers of Jesus in this falling, failing empire waited for God, rather than always trying to outrun what God's pace is. Now, part of what I think has to happen while we're waiting are several things. First thing that I think the scripture lives up that you and I have to fully appreciate is we have to be willing to wait for the revealed love. Somebody say revealed love. Say it again, revealed love. Verse number one says, see what marvelous love the Father has extended to us. And part of what we gestured a little bit at this last week when we talked about uh, how love is uh, generating from God, that, that the early patristics and church mothers talked about how love is something that generates. It proceeds from God. And that procession of love then grabs us. It infects us. Part of what I want you and I to be mindful of is there is the love that God seeks to reveal to you and I that is radically different than the love you get from the world. Now, just like time is the timing of the world can be different from the timing of God, how many know the love of God can be different than the love of this world. Now, sometimes that love will intersect and you'll get, you'll, get, you'll get glimpses of that love. But how many of you know that the love that emanates and generates, the scripture says, what manner or what marvelous love that the Father has extended to us, this love that comes from the Father is like a love you've never witnessed before. And for many of us, we are conflating the love of this world with the love of God, and it is like you have counterfeit and the real thing. You can have you a counterfeit. What, what's, what's, what's that expensive watch people we, uh, no, uh, Rolex. You can have you a counterfeit Rolex, and it will still tell time. But how many of you know when you try to, I don't know, trade it in, sell it, Somebody going to be like, oh, that's not the real thing. It's still time, but, you know, the time it tells is different than the value, the preciousness, the endurance of that product. Part of what I want to submit to you and I is that there is a love that God is attempting to reveal to us while we're going through our seasons of difficulty. Because the love that we are all uh, uh, formed to recognize rather easily is the love that makes us feel good. It is a love that affirms everything about you. It is a love that runs shivers down your spine and, 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 and fills you up with warmth. But how many of you know that uh, when that love leaves, there is still a love that is to endure? And this is the kind of love that scripture is speaking about. It is a love that carries you, not on the strength of its own inherency, but on the strength of the God from which the love comes. Oh, what's the best way I can talk about this? I mean, I want you to imagine that, that, that God has uh, all kinds 
of, 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 of pathways that are emanating from God's being. That, that rather than seeing God as a human being like you and I, because God is not a human, God is a spirit, God is something that, 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 that you cannot fully uh, imagine, and yet God is the source. I talked about it, I think, a little bit with Origin last week, that, that one is only uh, uh, as alive as they are connected to God early church father said this, that, that the devil is, is, is the furthest one can be away from God and still be alive. And, and so even the devil, even that, that personification of evil, that entity, that being, that, that, that had some proximity to God in, in his own life, that, that, that he is still existing, but he's existing as far away from God as one possibly can and still be in existence. And so you and I then, according to some of the early church uh, fathers and mothers, are on a spectrum <laughs> of proximity and existence to God. And our question, my question, we must wrestle with is what does it mean for you and I to make sure that we are constantly through the seasons of our life being drawn closer to God and all that God loves and has created. This world, it, 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 it capitalizes on our ability to easily put separation between us. I was reading this fascinating article. You know, I'm, 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 I'm trying to live into an anti-capitalist uh, practice of Christian faith. And it's hard because when you got things, how many know it's hard? <laughs> when you've been working to get your things, then you realize, man, these things is nice. Praise God. It's like when you didn't have nothing, it's like, oh, I do whatever. You know, I don't, well, who cares? Then when you get some things, it's kind of like the rich young ruler talking to Jesus. Oh, I done kept all the laws, Jesus. I'm one of them. I've I done it all. Jesus said, oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you showed, man, you're right. There's just a couple things I just want to lift up for you. You know, you know when Jesus started telling you a couple things, you in trouble. She said, you've done everything except for one thing. Sell everything you have. <laughs> Give it to the poor. Come follow me. This way start news. Um... Scripture, <laughs> scripture says he shook his head and he walked away. Now that's easy for all of us who ain't got nothing. Yeah, Jesus, take it. <laughs> I ain't got nothing. Just take it. Whatever, I just take it. <laughs> I can do that easy. I mean, you empty pockets. Well, you ain't giving Jesus nothing. But it's fascinating, the early church, when you read Acts 2 and many of the, the first several hundred years of Christian faith, they were very much communitarians. They didn't own possessions for themselves, according to the biblical witness. They had everything in common, and they shared one with another. And so this one article was talking about, are Christians supposed to be communists? I put it on our our. our, our uh, our Facebook page, just as a point of reflection, uh, because what's so fascinating about how the early church thought of this was not around an economic system or a materialist argument, which is the Marxist analysis of communism, but it was this sense of radical love that I love so much that I could never imagine that what God has given to me should be hoarded in such a way that it creates lack with other people. And this was such a revolutionary way of living for these folk in the early church that people would look at the manner of love that they had for one another. And they would come with curiosity to join this kind of community. And so it makes this scripture what marvelous love the Father has extended to us, an opportunity for you and I to ask the same question as I'm going through my seasons. If God is extending this radical love to me, what then are we called to do in return? But extend radical love to our neighbor. Not as an example of our own strength or, 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 or holiness, but as an expression, as the fruit of the tree of the radical love God has given to us. Now, if we are not being moved by this love, I want to submit 
that then we are possibly being turned from saints into demons. And, I, you know, I thought I'd throw that in there since we are on the, on the, on the, the, the immediacy of Halloween. Amen. There is no coincidence that the day after Halloween was All Saints Day. Amen. Because some of us had to get corrected everything we did the night before. Amen. <laughs> but in the Holiness Pentecostal Church, of which I and many of us are products of, and which you are baptized into since you are a member of the way, amen, you don't know that you're Pentecostal, but you are. Y'all get Pentecostal theology every Sunday. You're like, what are you? I'm yes, you're a Catholic Pentecostal. Huh? You're a non-denominational Pentecostal. You're a Buddhist Pentecostal. Amen. Whatever you just, just add Pentecostal to it. Touch your neighbor. I'm an agnostic Pentecostal. <laughs> you don't even know the Holy Ghost is moving in. You try to figure out what's going on. What's going on? That ain't nothing but the Holy Ghost. Give your neighbor a high five. I'm telling you nothing but the Holy Ghost. Just keep on living. It is so important to appreciate that there is a deep, deep work, which leads me to the second point, a deep work that you and I must be willing to wrestle with, and that is we are either being changed into saints or we're being changed into demons. We're getting closer to the love and the, and the, the, the source of all that is good and godly, or we're getting further away. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to get further away from God. I may not understand it all, may have a whole lot of frustration, but even in my frustration, God, may I draw nearer to you. Here's the first question you must wrestle with. We must wrestle with. The question simply says, is this extended love revealing itself in your changing seasons? As you're going through your seasons, is this love that is generating from God, this radical love, can you see the way this love is sustaining you? helping you, healing you, strengthening you? Are you cognizant of it? Or is it an anonymous love, a love that you can't recognize? Is this allowing you to become more saintly or more less of a saint? Questions for you and I to think about. The second thing that I think the scripture lifts up is that you and I must wait for revealed truth. Somebody say, wait for revealed truth. Verse number two, it has no idea, talking about the world, who God is or what God is up to. Anybody felt like that? God, I don't know what you're doing. I ask that at least every time I watch the news. I'm like, what is this, God? This can't be. Uh, Pastor Nisha just showed me a text that there was another church shooting in Texas last couple hours. Somebody went up into a church and shot up somebody in church. They burned another church down in Georgia or Louisiana, or maybe both. Got domestic terrorists running all across the country, trying to figure out, God, what's going on? They, 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 somebody ran down some folk down in New York, killed eight people. Things going on all the time trying to figure out, God, what are you up to? And often, because we can't ascertain what God is doing, our faith causes us to stop waiting, resort to old habits, behaviors, hello somebody, rather than waiting. I want to submit to you that in those times where you are not able to understand what God is doing, remember, there are many ways that God seeks to reveal God's self. That the truth of who God is and the truth of what God is doing may not always come at a moment or in a way that you can understand it, but you and I must be open to all the many ways God will reveal God's self. I, I appreciate the historical theological frameworks of how revelation happens in the early church or in down through theological discourse. They talk about God's self-disclosure to the world is through general revelation. Somebody say general revelation and special revelation. Somebody say special revelation. Now, it's important to appreciate that general revelation refers to the self-disclosure of God that all people can perceive by contemplating the evidence of God's presence in the world through nature, history, and human life in general. That there is all kinds of 
powerful expressions of creation and being that point to something beyond ourselves. And how many of you know, even though we may not fully be able to articulate who God is and what God is doing, we can still see that there's something that is happening that I fully cannot make sense of. And part of our challenge in this moment is to not allow that which we cannot make sense of to short circuit the truth of general revelation that God is doing in and around us every single day. Now, let's be clear. There are some purposes in the world that only you and I can fully understand through the special revelation that is through the church and through the the, the presence of Jesus and, and the work that Jesus did and all the miracles that Jesus performed. That helps you and I to certainly understand that there's something beyond your being that God seeks to accomplish, that you have an ultimate purpose that cannot be fully expressed through generalities. But I want you to appreciate that for all of us who are still on the road to understanding uh, what Paul Tillich calls the ultimate concerns, those things that are of ultimate purpose, that there is still lots of evidence and opportunity for you to make sense of these things that are generally happening around us. That when you look at the stars, when you look at the climate, when you look at the, the, the breakdown of our social societies, it is obvious that there's something generally going on that is out of alignment. I don't need a special revelation from God to convince me that climate change is real. <laughs> Man, all I got to look at are the fires, the hurricanes, the floods. Hello, somebody. Weird patterns. I don't need a special revelation to remind me that white supremacy and racism is real. I just have to look at history, the present, the White House, praise God. I don't need a special revelation to demonstrate that human exploitation and, 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 and the war economy and, and racism are, are triplets of evil, Dr. King says, must be defeated. I just have to look at the general state of the world. If I can even get a little bit more into your business, I don't need a special revelation to remind me of all of the things that I struggle with when no one else is around. I just have to be in tune with my own self and my own conditions. But the special revelation is so important because the special revelation helps you understand what God is up to. There can be something hopeless about you and I going through and not understanding the why or the what's next or the where help is coming from. But the special revelation, the revealed truth of what God is up to How many know it can help you endure every trial? It can help you make it through every circumstance. That God, I know that this is difficult and I know that I don't understand, but this one thing I know, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. And so if you feel forsaken, guess what? You just got to wait. Because how you feel now does not, Fully exhaust, never. Hello, somebody. Amen. Just because you're going through now don't mean that help ain't on the way. Just because you're having a struggle now don't mean that your situation won't turn on a dime because the God that we serve is able to do whatever we need God to do. And this is why I appreciate the special revelations when they come. I appreciate when the light comes on unexpectedly. Any of you ever been in a situation where you were just in a place of darkness, a place of no light, a place of fogginess, and you felt like your situation was spiraling out of control and you couldn't make sense of all the ups and the downs? You couldn't make sense of all the people leaving? You couldn't make sense of all the hurt and the harm? And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a light starts to shine. And God begins to remind you 
that there is more to you than the trouble you're dealing with. That there's more to you than what other people think or don't think. That there's something down on the inside that God is trying to help awaken out of a slumber that too often has been buried under the hurt of your past. And it is this kind of special revelation that I think God wants you and I to be mindful of. I love Athanasius. He's an African church father from the fourth century. And he says that we cannot know God in God's essence because God is unknowable by humanity. But listen, we do get to know God through God's actions for God's actions reach down to us. Lord, have mercy. It is basically saying that I may not be able to fully articulate how God is constituted or where God lives or what God is doing. But this one thing I know, when I get in a fight, God always reveals God's self as Jehovah Nisi. And it gives me a sense of belief to know that victory shall be mine. Uh, when I feel all alone, God reveals God's self as Jehovah Shammah, uh, which in the Hebrew just means that God is always present. Uh, when I am sick, God reveals God's self as Jehovah Rapha, which just means that God is my healer. Uh, and when I'm in need or I'm suffering from lack, uh, anybody ever had a revelation from God uh, that he is my Jehovah Jireh? Uh, which means he is my provider. And when my mind is confused and full of depression, uh, then I can be a witness that God reveals God's self uh, as Jehovah Shalom, uh, which means that God is my peace. Uh, and when I don't have time to say Jehovah Rapha uh, or Jehovah Jireh uh, or Jehovah Shama, uh, there is a name that I love to call. I love to sing his worth. It sounds like music in my ears. It is a name that is above every name. It is a name that every demon must bow down to. It is a name that when invoked, every devil has to go the other way. Does anybody know the name? That name is Jesus. Oh, how I love uh, to call the name of Jesus. Uh, there's power in the name of Jesus. Uh, there's healing in the name of Jesus. Uh, there's hope in the name of Jesus. Uh, can somebody holler Jesus? And so the final thing uh, that I want you to know, child of God, uh, that if you can understand and wait for the revealed love, uh, if you can wait for the revealed truth, uh, then you got nothing but change coming your way. Uh, somebody holler, change uh, is coming uh, my way. Uh, say it again, change uh, is coming uh, my way. Uh, how do I get the change? Uh, keep your eyes on Jesus. Uh, keep your eyes on the promise of God. Uh, because it is this promise uh, that if you can keep looking for it, uh, that if you can keep seeing it, uh, this promise uh, and this seeing uh, will transform you uh, from who you are today uh, to who God wants you to be tomorrow. Uh, I'm here to tell you, uh, there's more to you uh, than what you can see with your natural eye. Uh, there's more to you uh, than what you can feel with your hands. Uh, God has put something uh, inside of you uh, that the world can't take away. Uh, God has put something uh, inside of you uh, that the world needs right now. Uh, they need your intellect. Uh, they need your courage. Uh, they need your love for the hurting. Uh, they need the peace of God. Uh, they need the joy uh, that flows like a river. Uh, somebody shout hallelujah. And you can uh, get whatever change you need. Uh, if you just keep your eyes uh, on Jesus, uh, the more I see Jesus, uh, the more I can forgive you. Uh, the more I see Jesus, uh, the more I learn to love my enemies. Uh, 
the more I see Jesus, uh, the more I show mercy, uh, the more I see Jesus, uh, the more I embrace the poor, uh, rebuke the oppressor, uh, comfort the afflicted, uh, cast the devil out, uh, overcome the sin uh, in my life uh, and in the world. Uh, when I see Jesus, uh, I will be changed. Uh, it don't know uh, what I will be, uh, but this one thing I know, uh, when I see him, uh, I'm going to be just like him. Uh, I'm going to be just like him, uh, full of power, uh, full of anointing, uh, full of love. Uh, I shout. Be like him when he appears. And that's why I can be someone who stands with conviction. Not with an impulse, but with conviction that I will wait on the Lord. I will wait for the appearing of my God. Because it is in God's appearing that everything that concerns me can and will be addressed. Stay with me, everyone. Let's just take a few moments to ask the Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes my heart I want to see you hey, I want to see you grab the hand of someone next to you say open the eyes say open the eyes of my heart Lord this is my prayer Lord open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see 